I'm Lisa McGuire, I'm the Executive Producer at National Theatre Wales. Um, I'm Sarah Jane Lee and I'm a freelance independent producer. And we're here to try and answer the question, what does a producer do? Um, I, it's actually a question I get asked a, a, a lot, usually by people like my parents and uh, all of my friends. And yesterday I even got asked by my dentist. <laughs> um, so, and it's a really, really difficult question to answer. And I think it's quite a personal one. I think people, you know, the guys earlier said about when you're communicating your work, you've got to use your personality, and I think with producing, that's absolutely the case as well. And it really depends on how you're working, who you're working with, what scale you're working. It, it can encompass sort of everything, or be really bespoke in a way. Um, so what we're going to try and do, because um, Sarah and I did work together quite a bit, she assisted me um, last year with one of the biggest shows that NGW has ever made, um, but also works independently. So. Um, it's just through talking about what we have done, what we're doing at the moment, um, just give a flavour really, a, really practically um, how the producers <laughs> work, rather than try and give you a definitive definition, which is kind of impossible. Um, so we're just going to introduce ourselves. Uh, sure. So I'm Sarah, I've already said that. Hi again, that's my name. Uh, so I'm a freelance producer, I've been working for about four years, uh, ever since I came out of university. So. When I was about 16, 17, I decided I wanted to go to university because I wanted to be an actress. And I uh, auditioned for lots of drama schools and didn't get in. So then I auditioned another year and didn't get in. But I did get into Goldsmiths. And I was like, OK, Goldsmiths is in London. Seems quite cool and interesting. And yeah, it talks about theatre in a way that I can relate to. So I thought, OK, I'm going to go to Goldsmiths. And that was it. So I went to Goldsmiths. Um, I'm originally from Cardiff, so going to London was amazing because I saw lots of different performance types that I kind of never even knew theatre and performance could be. Um, I used to go and see a lot of kind of traditional plays that were at the new theatre in Cardiff, so kind of commercial touring plays. I went to London and the first thing I saw was A Disappearing Number by Complicite and that completely changed my view of what theatre was and I realised through doing my degree that actually I didn't want to be an actress and that I wasn't, I wasn't really truthfully an actress. Like I loved theatre. Um, but I think when you're growing up and you're kind of doing drama and you kind of love theatre that you think automatically like, oh, if I want to work in theatre then I have to be a performer. You don't think like, oh, there's a director or a producer or a marketing person or a press person, you think that's it. So at university somebody said to me, oh, we want to do uh, a show, we're going to have a budget for it, will you manage our budget? And I was like, oh, people are trusting me with money. Maybe like, oh. So um, I realised actually what I really liked to do was kind of facilitate people with great ideas and I loved theatre and I loved art and I wanted to help people to make the, heart, the art and the theatre that they really wanted to make. Um, so luckily at Goldsmiths they had a course in Arts Administration and Cultural Policy so I stayed on a year and I did a Masters in that. Um, don't really know what I learnt on that course. No, I did. I learnt a lot of things. But, um, uh, so yeah, they taught us all kind of like of how actually the system of theatre and things like that work and all of that kind of stuff. And then I got out of university and I decided I wanted to be a producer. So I had no experience with being a producer, didn't actually know what a producer was, still don't really know what a producer is, um, but I decided I would just start kind of doing it. So I started off helping people with kind of like marketing and press and that size because a lot of people when they make their own work they think oh I need someone to, to help like sell the show but actually what they need is something a bit more intrinsic and you can't just kind of employ somebody to just kind of sell your work as a project. I think you need someone to be kind of really intrinsically like linked with your work. So I kind of came out and I started working with uh, independent artists in Cardiff and that was actually through the NTW community, which has been said a lot about, but it's a great thing, because uh, it allows you to link up with people who are making work, making theatre, artists, who are photographers, like lots of different people, and to find people that you kind of want to work with and things like that. So I joined on that, and I started working with a lady called Tavi Edmond, who made a show called Wild, which was just on a chapter for two weeks, so I worked with her. And since then, I've worked with companies such as 
Good Cop, Bad Cop, who kind of make live art, performance, theatre kind of pieces. Uh, I worked on a show called Hear I, which just won Best Production at the Wales Theatre Awards, which is brilliant. And um, I've worked with Matilda Lopez with August Zero 12. Um, and I'm working with a few other companies as well called uh, Table 21 Productions. Basically, I work with a lot of different people on, on quite small scale shows. So that's kind of me and my experience. Uh, well, I also went to Goldsmiths, but quite a few years before, Sarah. Um, I've been working now for about 15 years um, in the arts, uh, not always as, as a producer, so um, interestingly, like Sarah, I think that experience of being at Goldsmiths, being in London, just absorbing loads of different kinds of work. And it's, the, the Goldsmiths is quite well known for its visual arts, and they have a quite good live art scene as well. Um, but obviously just making the most of being in that city and, and seeing the range of work. So for me, one of the, the very first show I saw when I was in undergrad was um, Robert Lepage's Seven Streams of the River Rota. So not a million miles away from that. That sort of work that makes you change your mind about how things are done and what, what you can achieve on stage at uh, a formative age is, is so important. So, but unlike Sarah, I decided that an MA would be a complete waste of my time and money. And um, I just wanted to work, really. So, so whilst I was at university, I explored all kinds of making work. So I directed, I was stage manager. I often found myself ending up in a role not dissimilar to a producer, but having, there was no formal introduction to that role existing. And I think, uh, it is it only quite recently that the role of the producer has become something that people are so suddenly obsessed by, and the, this term creative producer has come in. And you know, I've had the benefit of working with some um, amazing people during my career who've been producing for decades and decades, and they were never called that. They might be called general managers or executive directors, and, and there was nothing uncreative about what they were doing. So I think it's become. Uh, a bit of a buzzword recently, but essentially that sort of glue, those sort of people have always been there and always been doing kind of amazing things. Um, so, so although I wasn't, I, I, I didn't know exactly what role I wanted to take, I knew the kind of theatre that I liked, so I just went knocking on doors at the theatres that I loved. I was really lucky to get a first job um, at the Lyric in Hammersmith where I was actually um, a development <coughs> assistant, and development is a euphemism for fundraising uh, in the arts, because we don't like to talk about money. Um, and eventually, uh, after about being there for a year, I also took on their touring, and um, touring has been a big part of um, my career, actually, and um, taking work out and sharing it with different audiences in different places is, is something that I, I hope they will never stop doing, because it's amazing. Um, and from the Lyric, I went to the Young Vic in London at a, a really brilliant time to be working in that building shortly before they redeveloped it. So if you if you go there now, the building that you'll see is nothing like the mice infested uh, <laughs> falling down shack that I uh, got by in, but um, had the uh, benefit of working with people like David Land, like Rufus Norris, like Matthew Dunster. Um, at the time, I really, we really thought we could do anything in that space. And uh, the brilliant thing about the Young Vic is its relationship to um, its local community, which is really important. And, um, you know, it was set up to be uh, an answer to the old Vic. So if we think about the old Vic, like you might have done a paperback, um, sorry, a hardback book that costs you quite a lot of money and it's going to be around for a long time. The Young Vic was supposed to be like a paperback book. So it was built of concrete. It was only supposed to stand there for the five years it stood for 25. Um, the space is really um, free so you can move things about and uh, use it in lots of different configurations um, but it has a democratic principle that no one in the audience is more than uh, eight rows away from the action so none of that stall circle kind of business and just a really interesting way about thinking uh, about audiences and I suppose what I've learned is well my feeling about producing is that it's as much about artists as about <coughs> audiences and that we're the people in the middle that kind of try and help you take your vision and put it in front of someone who's, who's going to connect to it eventually. Um, but whilst I was at Young Vic, I did uh, a work with the, um, their Young Directors Programme, so it was a lot of artist development really, and I guess that's where I kind of found what the producing role could be, and did a lot of independent producing on the fringe, um, also had a company that I worked with, um, with uh, Matthew Dunster, and um, 
then I went on to work for Frantic Assembly, who were um, really one of my biggest influences. I, I saw them when I was 17 in my A-level college, and then they were the first company I saw on the Edinburgh Fringe and uh, at the Lyric and many other places. And I worked with them for uh, seven and a half years. So that was um, fascinating, just working with the same artists, building a really strong relationship with them and thinking about the kind of work we wanted to make, how we were developing our audiences, strategically where the company wanted to go. Um, and, you know, had a really successful period actually of massively developing our audience here in the UK and internationally as well. Um, we made a show with National Theatre Wales in National Theatre Wales' second year and I really fell in love with the company and thought they were all amazing and that the model is a fantastic one for a producer because there's really no limits, well, apart from the, the Welsh bit, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, we make work in all kinds of locations for all kinds of audiences and with all kinds of artists. So as a producer, it's constantly challenging um, and we're always sort of thinking about what each individual project needs. Um, but I suppose trying to balance that with the same sort of thing we had at Frantic of why are we doing it? So, so you know, you've got to still have a vision even though you're working with different artists all the time. Um, and do we want to say anything else about us? No, that's yeah, enough, isn't it? Yeah. So there's a really uh, great book. Uh, yeah. So we're going to talk now about what does a producer do, but from the perspective maybe of some other producers. So there's a really great uh, book that the, well, it's not even a book, it's like an essay, or is it a book? It's a, it was a book, it's now available so, online, so. There we go. So it's available online and it was commissioned by the Arts Council of England and Jerwood, uh, who are a tr uh, charity, and it's written by Kate Tyndall, uh, and it's called The Producers, Alchemists of the Impossible, and you can find it online, so if you just Google The Producers, Alchemists of the Impossible, you'll see it there. So, if we go to... It's a bit of a grand side. title, um, yeah. but it's just a lot of different people who produce work in different ways, kind of talking, trying to answer this big question that we're looking at today. Because I think that producing is different for me. I'm a different producer with whoever I work with or whatever project I'm working on because it requires every project requires different skills and different things, I suppose. Um, <coughs> oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <coughs> Uh, so this is Farooq Chowdhury, who runs a, a dance company called Akram Khan Company, and uh, his quote is, uh, I heard someone talking about the artist as inventor and the producer as innovator, who, in, who innovates the product into the marketplace, who leads on how you take it out into the wider world. This gives the artists more freedom, helps them to realise the scope of their potential, and to make the environment in which they work so much more enriching. So I suppose it's talking about that partnership, really, and sharing the load and um, kind of enabling the artist to be as free as possible because you're supporting them in a lot of the other things that uh, need to happen to get their work out to an audience. And I think it's also about, like, I feel like I, as a producer, when I work with an artist, maybe I'm looking at the work in like a different perspective to them and a different kind of... My More objective, friend. maybe, occasionally, <laughs> always. Yeah, because I think before, like, theatre and art in general is just so subjective that actually when you make a piece of art, you can think that you're making it and it's going to say this thing to an audience, but actually you make it and you come to the end of the process and actually maybe it can say a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So maybe it's about me, I try and look at a piece of work and see what is that piece of work saying and to which people is it kind of... Saying that to an extent. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, also I think one of the things that we can do that's quite interesting, I mean, I think we both would say that the earlier you're involved in a production or, or, or a project, the better. And I find one of the things about working with artists that's really important is that if you hear right at the start what they hope to achieve with that project, you can remind them of that yeah. at different stages during its creation. because. Sometimes it is about trying to, trying to please too many people or hearing too many voices. And you've got to be true to yourself and you've got to, you know, the work has to have an integrity. And um, of course you go on a journey when you're making something and it's allowed to change. But if it's changed because you've lost your way, that's different, you know, than, than changing because you, you've made new choices. Um, so I think, 
I'm not sure that's quite what Farouk means, but... Uh, yeah, I perhaps. think what's interesting is really, if you do get a chance to read it, what's really nice is that Akram Khan, uh, the dance and choreographer, actually says a bit about Farouk, and he talks about their relationship as being like a friend relationship. I think that's a really nice way to look at it, because mm. I feel like that's what I do when I'm working with people. It's that kind of really personal relationship. But, yeah. Uh, so this is Helen Cole, who um, is a producer, I think she produces uh, live out art and uh, the In-Between Time Festival, which I think has just happened and might still be happening in Bristol. <laughs> it's happening, there we go, at the um, Arnolfini. And um, she said, as a producer, it is my job to recognise this moment, to spot the possibilities, to listen to the dreaming, to replay the thinking, until the work takes shape and becomes real. I am then there to bring that work to an audience and a sector who will test it before it moves on. Because I believe that with all my heart that the right idea can reach fruition no matter how impossible it may seem. Um, and I suppose I pick this one because I like the way it's quite emotional and I feel like it shows how much of an emotional connection a lot of producers have with the work that they make. Because I think a lot of the time when we hear producer, like especially in the theatre world, we think of like commercial producers, you know, in the West End who um, are kind of out there to, they want to make something that's very sellable and maybe we don't think about them mm. in relation to making art. But I think that Helen has a real kind of connection with idea and making great art and really working with artists. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I think that, you know, as a producer, you've got to be working with the right artists and like vice versa, because it is a really uh, personal and emotional experience and, um, and it's quite hard, you know, and so you, if you want you to keep pushing and to keep the momentum up and to keep, you know, going through new challenges, you have to really care about that product reaching people at the end of the day, so thanks. Uh, and Helen Marriage from Artichoke. So Artichoke are uh, an uh, organisation that makes is involved in the making of quite big outdoors projects. Usually they're free for the audience to access, like the Sultan's Elephant that happened in uh, London and a lot of the other projects that have happened in Liverpool as well. So uh, she says, we love working with artists and that's what we do. Our aim is always to advance the next piece by an artist only in a context that makes sense for a public. Being a producer is about making decisions and taking responsibility. The thing I love doing is building teams of people who are all working to one end and who all feel real love for what they are doing. Um, and I, I think of the three quotes, this is the one that makes most sense to me um, in terms of a strong emphasis on, on, on the audience and on building teams. And when we talk a little bit about some shows in a moment, we'll see that you know, you can be working with some very small teams or very big teams, but it is about having the right people in the room, and, and that's true for artists, you know, equally, and um, surrounding yourselves with good people and making good relationships is, makes what we do easier. Um, next slide. Yeah. So we talked about the airy fairy thing yeah. that the producer does, but actually... We've, this is nuts we've and bolts. About, yeah, yeah, on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, like what we kind of do, and maybe how we help the people that we like, work with and stuff. Yeah, so, so not all of these things will be relevant to all projects, and this is really about the origination of a project, so we haven't gone into any detail about touring, for example, or um, any kind of digital distribution. This is just really the key elements. And um, obviously, when you, like Sarah, working on your own from, um, well, I would say her bedroom, but she normally comes into our office. Uh, you know, you Sometimes. can be doing all of these things, and if you have, if as lucky as I am to work with some fantastic people um, at National Theatre Wales, they, they are maybe doing some, some of this delivery, but it's still my responsibility to have a, an overview on, on uh, the thinking behind things. So budgeting and fundraising, um, you know, yeah, money's important at the end of the day. Um, you can't do it can't make amazing things happen without some level of resource, although it is incredible what you can do for very little if you have the right kind of uh, approach. But um, yeah, sketching, turning a project from an idea into something that is achievable, a budget is an essential tool and then managing that budget all the way through. Um, you know, you don't, but you don't really need to be held to your budget. They are, they are, they're a tool to manage your project. So 
you can make big decisions to reallocate money from one thing to another. You just can't spend more than you have. <laughs> That's the basic principle. Um, and obviously, in terms of writing applications, what I said earlier about being involved with the project at, in its inception, uh, that's essential if you're going to go out and raise the funds, whether that's from co-producers or Arts Council Wales or independent trusts and foundations. You've got to really understand that project and what you want to achieve with it and know how to get other people excited about it. Um, how is it going to benefit them? What is in it for them? Um, so you can get that um, partnership in place and, and get your project moving. I think budgeting is also really important because I find that until I actually start budgeting a project with an artist, maybe sometimes the artist or myself, we don't actually realise how big that project <coughs> might potentially be and there's two of us creating it and we need to raise £50,000 to like do it. Um, so I think it's always it's a really important thing doing that and also I've put in there like ensuring everyone is paid because a lot of the artists that I work with are either making their first piece or um, are maybe making their own kind of work uh, and they haven't really kind of made their own work in a kind of formal way before so actually making sure that everyone is paid and that you are and you are doing a project if you are doing it and it is your living like obviously everybody should be paid like a living wage and things like that so it's about really planning for that and going Okay. Um, so I suppose the next one is scheduling. So we like making lists. Sounds really exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we like making lists. We like Excel documents. Yeah, we're ge producers are geeks, basically. <laughs> um, timelines, as the ladies mentioned when they were talking about uh, comms, are essential. I have um, this weird matrix, which is like every question you need to ask yourself about a show. It's massive. Uh, you don't need to ask. Ev you don't need to answer every question for every show. But if you don't ask, you might forget something. So as I said with National Theatre Wales, if we're making a show in a field rather than theatre, we have to ask ourselves questions about who's going to sell the tickets, who's going to, you know, where are the toilets, can everyone park and stuff, as well as, you know, the more kind of imaginative questions about the work itself. It's so it's about knowing when they need to be that, that needs to be done by or say you're like producing a show and you're working with venues or different promoters and people, it's about knowing when they need the flyers or the promotional material by so they can actually go and like, you know, promote your show and get an audience in for you. So it's all those like little kind of deadlines that you need to know that Okay. But they're really, you know, I mean, as I said, the guys have already mentioned planning a lot, but I think it's that in, in those moments when you are, like, your head is swimming with, like, how many things need to be done and sort of slight panic is setting in, that it's really fantastic to have something like this to just anchor you and just help you think about really what is the essential things that need to be done, like, that week or that month to keep the project on track. I mean, it's good to always read and look at your schedule because things do change, like, the performances... Mm aspects of the performances will change, things that you want to do will change, so you're always rescheduling your schedule, but mm -hmm. you have something there in the first place. Uh, uh, so yeah, so employing and contracting, uh, again, not the most exciting part of the job, but really important. So uh, when we're hiring an artist to come and work with us, the contract, their contract is our agreement with them that says what we expect of them and what they can expect of us. Um, so, of course, things like when people get paid is really important, but it, it, what their deadlines are that they need to meet, um, what will happen if we take that work on again in the future, any non-availability they have, um, you know, what they, it basically it kind of lays out how we're going to work together. Um, and it can be hugely time consuming. We, at National Theatre Wales, obviously, we need to keep on top of, you know, what is best practice in the industry and what the other... Uh, you know the uh, unions and stuff are setting and keep to that and keep on top of developments that are happening with things like live streaming or um, putting your work out um, in cinemas and all these kind of things um, and just the, you know contracts are really important because they just underpin the relationships and we can all say yeah we want to work together and it's all really nice and da -da -da -da, but actually sometimes things go wrong and contracts are a really good uh, just a reminder of, of, of what's happening and who's doing what when. I think even if it's just two of you making something it's also good to have like a contract or a letter of agreement or something that does it even on the smaller scale because again like almost if you're even working with a smaller scheme yeah an impact of something going wrong can be bigger than sometimes if you're working with a large group of people sometimes so it's an important part so yeah kind of covered it a bit but organizing logistics so booking rehearsal spaces 
uh, actually working out when the is going to happen, like arranging production meetings, make sure, I mean, it's basically making sure that everyone knows what they're doing, but also making sure that everything's in place so that people can make the work that they want to make. Yeah, and then they're not in a horrible rehearsal space that pains them to turn up to every day and those kinds of things. Good to check them out in advance rather than rely on pictures on the internet. A bit like houses. Um, uh, I, I think this area, although it, again, sounds quite boring, um, it's, I find when we're working with artists for the first time who maybe haven't worked with a producer or a producing organisation, it's actually this sort of stuff that's a really grey area. They become really confused about the fact that someone else is trying to do it for them. And it's like, it's really boring. Let it go, let it go. But um, I think that it's worth being really clear that this is the sort of stuff you can expect a producer or production manager to do for you. And I would say it's the first sort of stuff you should get off your to-do list and, and allow someone else to do for you. Because when your head's full of all that kind of getting things right, um, then you know you just can't think about the other stuff. And uh, uh, as I said, I've been working for 15 years, and I still sort of have a mild panic attack every Sunday night for the first day of rehearsal on the Monday that no one knows where they're going or that we're all going to turn up the wrong place or something like that. So should probably say that producers are also quite obsessive people. If you have picked up on that already. Yeah. Uh, so the next one's legal. So we've mentioned contracts. Also say health and safety. Obviously, that's like risk assessments and making sure everybody's safe and if they Evacuation, are yeah. sign off on seating banks, uh, working with animals, children, all that kind of fun stuff, which we seem to do endlessly at National Theatre Wales. Um, and insurances and licenses. Um, the lady who ran Frantic Assembly before me used to do a fantastic workshop about setting up a company. And uh, she would give, them, give people fantastic advice about setting up a company, about going to Edinburgh, about you know, breaking your company through. But the one thing that she would stress was if you walk away with no other information in your brain, get some insurance. And that was like her final comment. Because really, genuinely, when you're first starting out, you probably don't sometimes appreciate that when you are employing people in any way, shape or form, you are responsible for their well-being. You're also responsible for any equipment that you hire or anything else. It's really you can get really good, cheap uh, insurance through a provider that the Independent Theatre Council works with. It really is not a prohibitively expensive thing, and it just gives you a peace of mind that if something goes wrong, you're not personally liable for it. Particularly if you haven't yet got to the stage where you have any kind of um, proper organisational legal structure for your company. So it's really important. And as a performer, you should know that you're working in a place that there is insurance, you know, in case you know something happens to you, um, it's your livelihood. So, and music, don't get caught out using music that you don't have permission to use. It can or be really expensive and horrible. Or anything. Yeah. Anything that, so a lot of people, I think, yeah, if something exists online and you're able to find it, don't necessarily think that you can just then like use it in a show or something because that's obviously somebody else's creative thing that they've created and that mm. is their livelihood and stuff so you will need to like contact the creator and ask them whether you can use it and maybe if they're uh, under PRS pay some money to PRS to use it so they get paid for that that's another big thing that we look at and do <laughs> uh, so marketing and PR so obviously this is different from if you're working independently like me. I don't have a marketing and PR company. On some projects I employ somebody who does PR for me because they have the contacts that I don't have and they've already got those and PR I think is, an, you know, if you're making a show or you're making anything or an exhibition, employ somebody who is a proper PR person because they're invaluable. Um, so yeah, so I basically, if I'm making it and I'm producing on my own, I will look after the graphic design, so I won't do it myself, but I'll either employ somebody or I'll kind of look over that kind of vision of the marketing, so what is it going to be? Are we going to market in, in a traditional sense? Are we going to do anything crazy, like a flash mob or something like that? So I'll kind of create the whole market. I'll be basically me and, and Catherine put together uh, and do everything. But otherwise, if you're working... <coughs> For a bigger company, then you might have a caption and a real, so you might instead be kind of. Yeah, I mean, at Frantic Assembly, for example, we didn't have uh, core staff who did marketing or press, but we worked with an agency. So we would, at the outset of every project, um, 
look at the parameters with them of what we wanted them uh, to deliver, were they looking at after the whole UK tour, for example, or just um, our dates in London. They would support us uh, in the generation of uh, image and copy, although I think it's really important that artists are involved in that um, as well. Uh, and then they would monitor like the weekly sales with us and with the venues and call the venues on a kind of regular basis and, and do a lot of the uh, logistics. We would sort of staff up when we were on tour essentially and then uh, you've already met my brilliant colleagues at National Theatre Wales who look after our marketing and press. So for each show they have to think afresh about you know what's the way in for an audience, uh, what are our targets, uh, how many people do we want to see it, how much do we need to generate the box office, uh, what kind of level of profile are we looking for this show and for our funders and for the artists that we're working with um, and you know at the, this moment in time you know you might think oh National Theatre Wales yeah they've got loads of stuff yada 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 but we, our team of three is working on a tour that's going to six venues at the same time as developing campaigns for five shows that we're going to announce in two weeks as part of our year five so that's actually a huge amount of, uh, of work for one organisation to be thinking about in that kind of really systematic and creative way from start to finish so um, but obviously it's great because we all have a shorthand, there's lots about the company that we all already know, um, but we, we, they do the hard work, I just endlessly ask them if they've done it yet. Uh, <laughs> next. <laughs> Last slide, we promise. This is our, the end of our day today then. Mm. Uh, so, thinking about accessibility, so obviously uh, we think about accessibility sometimes it's to do with maybe disability, um, so thinking about whether, you know, how can we open this up to a wider audience? Because I think when you say general public, there isn't ever a general public. Everybody's an individual and we need to start looking at people like that. So, you know, ensuring that the show is accessible. So if you are going to do it in a field, then like making sure in some way that people can accept, you know, access that who do need assistance with mobility and um, interpretation. But also thinking about things like can people get to it? So obviously if you're in somewhere like the Arts Centre, you know, it's a pretty, people can get to places like this, or they used to get into places like this, but again, if you're not doing it in a theatre, like how can people actually access it? Um, also, ticket prices, I think that's a big accessibility thing. So when you're obviously doing your budgets or doing all that other financial things, uh, or applying for funding, thinking, okay, who do I want to see this show? And like we had said before, like how much can they, Pay or do I want them to pay to kind of come in and see it? So really thinking about the audience <coughs> in that sense. Yeah, and that might include you know specific offers and concessions um, because you don't want to. You need to get a balance, I suppose, between making your work as accessible to people as possible. If you're publicly funded, obviously, if you're not, you can go for your lives. Um, but uh, making sure that you know. Like, for example, at the National Theatre on the South Bank, they have an amazing scheme called the Travel X scheme, and you can buy tickets for their shows for what was £10, I think it's now £12. But I know for a fact that the first people who go and buy those tickets are people who could pay £40 for a ticket, and often will do in a different one of their auditoriums. So it's choosing ticket prices that are going to work for the right audiences, but also what's the mechanism for them getting to them, so that the right people are using them, and that you're not undervaluing your work for people who will happily pay that kind of money to go to the opera or go to the football. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of thinking and planning to be done on that front. Uh, and then evaluating and reporting. So I suppose if you are getting money from, fundry, uh, from like funders and things like that, they're going to expect you in the end to kind of report back to them and tell them how you spent that money. Um, but also it's really good to do it for yourself as well because you can obviously see maybe in areas that you maybe think next time you could do better or you could do different activity to like do better. Um, just something we should generally kind of do. Yeah, and that's artistic as well as practical. Yeah. So I think, like, for example, with every show that we do at National Theatre Wales, John and I meet, John's our artistic director, meet with the lead artists, um, and going back to objectivity uh, a little bit after the show, so when they've had some time to digest and to recover and to uh, recuperate. Um, and, and, and go back to, you know, what was the vision and how far did you get to achieve it? Is there anything you would have changed? Did we, you get the right support from us? Um, and, and then I do that with each of the teams, so cast, uh, production teams, design teams, um, just checking if there's anything we can learn for the future. 
Um, we tried to do it with the marketing side of things, you know, what were the tools that worked for us on this one, what, what were the ones that perhaps weren't the right choices. Um, basically, you, you know, you do need to look back and review in order to get better. So, and, and everyone should really try and find the time to do that if they can. Um, and I think if you don't want to evaluate your own work, sometimes it's because you are hiding from it a little bit, because it can be a bit scary. Um, but it's definitely worth doing. Yeah, I think the, the marketing side is really important because I find I'm like looking at Twitter and Facebook advertising at the moment and thinking like, oh, does this actually work? So actually now with kind of Twitter and Facebook advertising, you can kind of look and see how many people actually like click through on your advert and obviously look at how much money that you spent on it and think, actually, is that worth me doing that or what do I get out of that and kind of really looking at that. Because if you are working by yourself or with a small team and you have a small budget, then actually every penny you spend, you want to spend in the most effective you know, way, basically. Yeah, and, and, and too often we just make certain assumptions and I think that, it, you know, you anecdotally think it's something happened in this sort of certain way, but when you actually dig into the detail, you're, you can be surprised actually about like, oh, I thought, you know, most of my, I thought it was a really young audience, oh, but most of the people who booked were over 55. You have, you know, but you actually look at the hard facts, you can't sort of hide from them, and um, that, it, you know, it's good to be reminded. Um, and then to the final one, looking after everyone and making sure they are happy. Yeah, the hardest part of the job. Yeah. Uh, you know, like making good work isn't always easy, so it's not, you know, a holiday camp, everyone's not going to be happy all the time. Um, but I think it's just, yeah, checking in with people on yeah. a regular basis, making them feel like their work is important to you, like they're cared for. Um, that if things that have been put in place are not the right things, that you can change them. You know, the budgets, the schedules, all the things that we talked about, that, that you set them yourselves, you know, they are malleable, they can change to fit the, the developments that are happening around you. Um, so being kind of flight of foot in that way um, is good. And just hearing what's happening in the room, I think, is really important. You can't be two arms length because um, you won't hear the right things. So don't be afraid to ask questions of people. Yeah. And also, if you are working with a producer, don't be afraid to tell them if there's a problem. Like, sometimes I think people really feel like they have to solve everything themselves or the fact that they're not feeling good or is their fault. And actually, you know, we can change things so quickly. We can't, we're here to fix things and to make the right things happen. So um, just share your fears, your thoughts, your, you know, um, feelings. That's what we need to do our jobs yeah. properly. Oh, next slide, please, Simon. So we're going to talk about two shows that we've worked on. Well, we were English. going to. Let's have a review. Um, do people want yeah. us to talk more? Yeah. Is we, that have, we have been talking for quite a while. We have. Um, we're still within our time at the minute, yeah. but it feels like maybe, maybe would be you know, the other side of the question was how can we help you? So if people have like really a lot of questions or, um, you know, it would be good to throw that over a little bit, we can do that now. Or we can go on to talk more specifically about these two productions that might give you more of an insight. So being democratic, yeah, <laughs> lots of blank faces. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> should we, we plough on then? Yeah. We'll do it quick, we'll do it quick. Um, so the show that I'm going to talk about, that I produce, is called Here I. Um, which, and the, there's a few people that I think have seen it in the audience, and the lovely Jill programmed it here at um, Aberystwyth, so that was great. Um, so Here I is a really small scale show, it's got three performers within it. It's then got a, the company surrounding that, it's then a production manager, myself as producer and we have a director called Jesse. Uh, so Here I is the first show by the company and the company hadn't kind of made work before as an entity before they made this. Um, so it was devised over a period of say three to four years, so a long time. I think a lot of people when they make work sometimes think that you have to make it really quickly but actually making work takes quite a lot of time. And it was devised uh, by Jesse Britton who's got a play on here on the 13th, so I'd say go and see that, just do a little plug for him. Um, so by the big James Jones, who's was holding the sheep, and uh, by Max McIntosh, who's was holding the guitar. Uh, so they started making the show at the Lyric Lounge, which was a scratch night, so I know we've talked a bit about scratch, so 
uh, scratch night where they kind of had a day to work on an idea and play with an idea that they had and then at the end of that day they kind of went on stage and performed the beginnings of their ideas to an audience and then that audience basically fed back to them what they thought of the show um, and luckily they thought that the show was interesting and it should be kind of developed further and people laughed so that's always a good thing when you're making a bit of a comedy it's not good um, if you're not making comedy <laughs> but maybe you should be making a comedy um, but so here life is basically uh, Bud's story so Bud grew up on a farm in West Wales in Newcastle Evelyn and when she got to 17, 18 she decided that she didn't want to become a farmer and that actually she wanted to move to London and become a theatre designer um, and this is obviously quite a big leap for her, but it, the show is all about her kind of recollection and her story about how she moved from that to there to where she is currently, basically. So it's a very kind of sort of biographical, autobiographical, like story of her uh, thing. And so obviously that is quite a resonant story in somewhere like Wales and in a lot of places. I think, you know, everybody has maybe taken that step where they like leave home and they go somewhere else and it's that big kind of new thing and maybe the people at home don't maybe understand why they're doing that or what it is that they're going to go and do to do that. Um, so started at the Lyric Lounge, then um, very lovely Simon, uh, he and Gareth who now is the artistic director, he, um, they took the kind of the initial start of the show on and put it on as part of their incubator programme. And I would recommend, if you're making work for the first time or you're making a new piece of work, I would recommend looking for something like the Incubator Programme or um, it's basically an artist development plan. So a venue or a company will give you some money and some space or something like that to kind of help you develop an idea for a show. So again, it's that kind of, we talked about research and development, so really kind of looking at the show and thinking like, is this good, is this interesting? And it allows you to kind of develop that show, but also allows that venue or and other industry professionals to kind of like look at your show and think, oh, am I interested in that? Am I, is that something that I would like to then carry on supporting and carry on kind of doing? So it went and did that then. And then I came on board and then uh, we applied to Arts Council Wales for a small research and development grant that was, I think, £3,000 and the team spent a week kind of developing that show and they were all paid to do that and they did it at the Wales Millennium Centre. From there, so having that support from those different places, so from the Lyric Hammersmith, from the Wales Millennium Centre and Incubator, um, we then had some support from National Theatre Wales, from Team. So it's all about, I suppose, I'm trying to link it back to earlier and talk about how to make a show. We kind of worked with a lot of different people who all kind of helped us. So National Theatre Wales with their team programme, they supported us. The Wales Millennium Centre. So it's about making relationships with lots of different people who are maybe like interested. Can yeah. I ask something? Were you actually employed by National Theatre Wales to do that? No. So how were you paid? It's yeah, they're obviously not, you know, an established company I with wasn't, funding to pay a producer. I wasn't being paid at this point. So I basically, the way that I work with this company is that I uh, apply for funding with them for, uh, for pots of money for certain things, to so say for the research and development. And then within the funding that I apply for, I'd apply for a fee to help to cover my future work on that project or during that time. Um, obviously, larger companies, if they like working with you and they have the, you know, they have the fin you know, they have finances, then they will employ you, on, say, a daily rate or a rate to kind of work with them. But I suppose that's why we had the, the, the thing about the heart because the projects that I work on, I work on because I think they're going to be brilliant and they're going to be great and they really interest me. So a lot of the time, maybe I won't be being paid for the work that I presently do. If that makes sense. Um, so then we um, applied for like a large grant from the Arts Council of Wales and took it forward. We were also lucky enough to take the show to Edinburgh um, and I kind of helped take that show to Edinburgh. Um, don't really know how much of this is like really actually helpful to you guys. Well, I think it's just keep going with the journey of the show because oh, okay. I suppose it's taking something from, you know, a, a scratch right through to winning the Wales Drama Award. What more could you ask for? Uh, and touring internationally to New Zealand. Nobody knows about that, yeah. But they do now. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so this is, I suppose I'm just talking about the generation of the show. So from getting our small grant from Arts Council Wales, we applied for a large grant from Arts Council Wales, which enabled us to do a tour of four venues, which included the Aberystwyth Arts Centre. So I suppose all the time I'm kind of working with the company to build the networks, like writing the fundraising up, up applications. Uh, we then, from that, we went to Edinburgh where we won an Ideas Tapping Award to take the show there. So we were funded to take that there. And we were lucky enough that we worked with a PR person and they managed to get our show reviewed by the national papers, which is quite, um, I feel like, an achievement for quite a new show with a new company. And you don't often kind of get those uh, opportunities to do that. And luckily enough, the journalists liked the show okay, and lots of them gave us four stars and told people to come and watch it. So we, had, we ended up selling out the last two weeks of our run at Edinburgh, uh, which is a great opportunity. We came back, we did our tour here, we went to four venues, and then we worked with the Night Out Scheme, um, who are, um, who Nicola works with as well, um, who basically support rural touring around Wales. So they will support companies to take work all around Wales and for you to work with the promoter. But it's not kind of like, I'm a company and I want to come here. Kind of like I'm a company. This is the show that I, that we have kind of like made, and we'd love to come to your venue, and we think it'd be great for your venue. And then the promoters get to choose from a huge list of like artists and companies who they'd like to come and perform at their venue. But so we went to eight venues in the night out scheme. Uh, we then what do we do next? We're now touring in from April to June, and we won a, the Wales Drama Award for Best Production in the English Language. Did you mentioned that before. <laughs> <laughs> we had the third time, right, okay. and just like, but yeah, that was up against Mammoth. Um, yeah. uh, and we're doing a. We've now got a London run for the show, so we've kind of we're, we're at the Soho Theatre from the 18th to the 21st of March. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, we are hopefully going to New Zealand in the autumn to do an eight-week tour out there. So I suppose as a producer, I've kind of worked with that company to go from that initial stage of being an incubator and making that show to kind of touring, which shows now touring Wales and is going kind of further afoot. And that's not just me, that's me working with that company. Whenever I work with a company, I think I'm more of, a, in a way, a kind of co-producer because they make the work, I help them make the work, and we work together to take the work out there. Bird not only performs on the show, but she does all the graphic design for the show as well. Uh, Max has composed the show and is currently going to run our Tumblr. So it's a complete group effort, and uh, I don't know, I'm kind of like there, coordinating and... But I think it's fair to say that you, you know, at each stage of the journey, you're thinking, well, what's, what's yeah. next for the show? I mean, you can only can only happen if you have a good show, right, that has legs. But you're thinking, well, you know, we've done really well here, but we can think a bit bigger and maybe go a bit further afield yeah. and speak to a wider audience. And obviously the show resonated beautifully here in Wales, and I think Night Out was perfect platform for it. But you saw in Edinburgh that people from mm. all over really responded to that kind of quite universal theme. And, yeah. you know, international promoters have seen you've got that potential as well. But it, you know, it would be hard for the, the team to be doing that on their own because, yeah. again, it's that objectivity and that ability to speak for the work and be an ambassador for it and to kind of celebrate it, which sometimes is hard to do for yourself, you know, and, and actually having a champion of which your producer can be um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it helps you take it uh, maybe one step further than you might have imagined. So Yeah, and thinking about that, I mean, we didn't know that people in New Zealand, like, People, programmers from New Zealand were going to like it, but um, met a lady called Claire who's a producer out there and she was um, hanging around the NTW office and so me and her had a cup of tea and she was taking a show to Edinburgh. So I went to see her show in Edinburgh and she came to see Here I and from Here I she loved it. So I think it's about creating those opportunities, like you said, and those new platforms to kind of take the show. But also it takes a lot of time to kind of put together a tour or to make contacts with those tours and sometimes need that kind of person pushing it. But you need to be yeah. tenacious, without a doubt, which you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I'll just briefly talk about Mamets, which didn't win the Wales Drama Award, <laughs> uh, which was um, 
produced by NTW in the summer of 2014. I think it's just a really interesting counterpoint to Here Right, basically, because it's a completely different scale. Um, it happened in a completely different time frame. Um, so rather than having the sort of genesis, slow burn genesis that Sarah described with Here I've, uh, we kind of magicked it overnight almost. Um, Owen Shears, the writer and the creative associate called Chris Morris, had actually been, um, had made a documentary film about Mamet and, and the Battle of Mamet's Wood, which happened as part of um, the, the Battle of the Somme during World War I, about 10 years ago and become sort of really fascinated by it and, and really were keen to find a way of being involved in the commemorations um, uh, during this centenary. Um, period. And they came to National Theatre Wales uh, about two years ago with a vision for a site specific place set in a trench. And um, they, they had some ideas about how they would um, bring the production to life. Um, but uh, National Theatre Wales weren't sure really um, ex exactly, you know, we do a lot of site specific work, we do a lot of outdoors work, and we, we don't want to get into the sort of gimmicky kind of. Um, place with it and we and we really needed a bit more to just sort of land it and make sure that we were going to be representing you know really difficult territory I think culturally commemorating big events like the First World War and we wanted to make sure we had the right sort of tone and uh, kind of approach to doing that so Owen spent a long time uh, researching and became um, really keen to incorporate the work of two Welsh writers um, uh, who in, when Wynne Griffith and um, David Jones, and um, he sort of went off on a journey of how he might do that, and and all of a sudden we had a bit more energy under it. Uh, we had very strong interest from 1418 Now, which is the organisation that are responsible for the artistic uh, commemorations of World War One. They did, you know, the poppies at the Tower of London and the Lights Out um, app and that kind of thing. And they really were keen to have an event in Wales. Um, that was Wales specific and so we sort of floated this idea to them and they thought it would be amazing and we talked originally about maybe doing it in 2016 which is at the actual centenary of the Battle of Mount's Wood but we discovered that Owen Shears was going to be out of the country for that entire year so um, sometimes you just have to be a bit crazy really if you believe in an idea and just go for it and we, we decided that we would make it uh, in June 2014 around about November 2013. Um, and uh, it involved, unlike here, I th uh, a team of 80 to 100 people worked on it. Uh, actors, production, creative team, backstage, marketing, press, etc. cetera. Um, involved a community cast as well as a professional cast of 16. Um, we didn't have the first draft of the script until two weeks before rehearsals. We cast roles for parts we didn't know what the names were going to be um, we had made certain assumptions about the work being played outside at massive scale and then when we read the play realized that it was actually really intimate <laughs> um, lots of dialogue that would be completely lost in the middle of a wood um, and had to think about how we could create a performance space actually that would um, do that that play justice so went through all kinds of machinations that at one point we were crazy enough to consider building a black box theatre in the middle of a field in Husk <laughs> and like that's where objectivity <laughs> becomes really important like hey guys do you think maybe this idea has gone far enough now we should just step <laughs> back and think about how you know what do we do well and how do we approach site specific work best and which is making use of what is already existing in that space and the designer actually flipped his thinking around and chose to use an existing barn on that farm site but to apply the exact same concept about photography and apertures to this barn so we took it over and we created almost exactly what they had envisaged in this new theatre we were going to build um, and made it in the barn which worked brilliantly because we suddenly had a controlled environment where you could hear what everyone was saying um, the audience of 200 people wasn't going to get you know rained upon every evening um, but we could still evoke the same things that we wanted to because when we opened this massive wall we saw the wood which was the whole point of being there and then what we created which I think was just really exciting to be part of was a show that was kind of like half site specific and half in a theatre 
um, and we were able to use the scale of that landscape, but but also achieve something more intimate and um, put the stories across more delicately. Um, so what I was saying earlier about revising budgets and changing ideas, the, 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 the loss of the temporary theatre meant that we could suddenly employ another four actors, which we did, and they were then able to uh, achieve a greater kind of habitation of the, of the site that we were working in. Um, yeah, just dealing with real life events, I suppose, that we all felt uh, under a massive weight of responsibility to do justice to the, to the people that we were talking about. So we did a, quite a lot of research and went out to the Mets and the whole company of actors um, were able to visit the, the wood and the site that we were talking about. Um, actually, I haven't mentioned that Sarah was the assistant producer on Mammoths and she organised all of that trip, which would have been completely beyond me. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a, a large-scale piece involved, not just Owen's text, but song, movement, um, design that took over four different locations, all of the logistics involved in getting 200 people to ask every day to see the performance. Um, and uh, we really had the weather on our side, which I was very grateful for, but obviously we had lots of plans in place if we hadn't have done. Um, anything else to say, really? No, I suppose the other thing, um, just coming back to objectivity, is um, just when you're developing work, um, you know, it's great to have the input of others at different stages. So when you first see first designs, when you first read the script, uh, redrafting, all of those things. And um, I think that doing that once you're in the final stages of making is really, really important as well. So for Mamets, we had um, a, a really early open dress rehearsal where um, NTW team members came to see the show. And uh, we couldn't have understood if that show was going to work or not until we had an audience in to see if they were making the choices that we hoped they would in terms of moving around the space to see how they responded to the work uh, that we were presenting and from that early dress rehearsal through the previews we were taking really big decisions every day to edit, to cut, to reimagine um, the show so that by the time we got to press night it was a really different experience actually than it had been from that early dress rehearsal so I think the more you can let people in, I mean not all work benefits from that, you know, it really depends yeah, on the type of work. No, but I guess Here I th is Bud's story yeah, and like it's about getting, well. yeah, whereas we are dealing with world events and trying to make a piece of work that uh, accurate, you know resonated with a lot of people so having that input was um, was really invaluable uh, yeah. that's it any questions